Hello everyone, welcome to the episode 60 of Soul Lead Saturday. The guest we have today, Linda Gates. She is an educator and connector and has been engaged with blockchain technology since 2012. She is co-founder, secretary of the board and executive vice president of DFM Data Corp Incorporation and recently served as president and CEO of Blockchain Chamber of Commerce headquartered in Atlanta. Ideator of the blockchain ecosystem.io platform, Linda is passionately engaged in facilitating the responsible use of cutting edge technologies for the betterment of humanity. Spearheading the emerging universal framework of things, consortium, Linda leads to serve and supports a variety of nonprofits, including her favorite charity, bloominthedark.org. Wow. I can't wait to hear more from her. So let's just welcome her and hear more about her career journey. How did she find her area of interest and managing to lead that? So welcome Linda, very happy to have you on the show and really appreciate all your time and consideration on the Saturday morning. Very happy to be here. And thank you for what you're doing to help highlight women leaders and help everyone understand that there's a positive place for them in leadership. So. I, I really appreciate what you're doing and happy to be here with today. Yep. Thank you so much. And I would love to hear more from you. So moving towards our next section, which is about passion and interest. How did you find your passion in this field and what steps did you take to pursue that passion or what motivates you to be in this field? Yeah, at, at my core, I am a connector and an educator. Okay. And so I, I taught for 13 years. And um, everything, regular education, special education, gifted, um, I, was, I was a teacher. And so mm -hmm. I, I left teaching to caretake for my in-laws. My father-in-law was diagnosed with Lewy body's dementia. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we all have family. We all know how that is. Um, you know, the, the joys and responsibilities and that three and a half years um, probably some of the most challenging and rewarding times of my life. And what it, what it did do is it gave me a time of reset. Uh -huh. And uh, I had, along with my husband, decided to invest and diversify in Bitcoin back in 2012. Uh -huh. And that was shortly before the, the caretaking time frame. And so when we we ended the three and a half years my father-in-law did end up passing away and you know it was you know life, life is like that you have to you have to embrace the moments that you have and uh so i got the choice to decide what i wanted to do not not what i had to do not what i needed to do to to have the right insurance package or to be able to um you know manage the expenses but what did i really want to do Mm -hmm. And that's when I chose to focus on blockchain technology. And it was, uh, it, it was, it was a journey, um, a very interesting one to be sure. I, I connected with the community there in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, got to participate in one of the very first meetings of the Blockchain Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And so they had everyone raising their hand, you know, how long have you been uh, owning Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone, one month, everybody's hands up, you know, two months, three months, hands start going down. And by the time they got to five years, I still had my hand up. Mm -hmm. And at three years, there were no other hands up. At four years, there were no other hands up. At five years, and so everybody's looking at me and I'm looking at, I'm going like, I didn't know that what I chose to do back in 2012 was so ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that put me on the radar of the, the leading team there at the chamber. And they asked me to participate in some events, which I did. And in a debate mm -hmm. where I argued on the side of smart. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's regulations and then there's smart regulations. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've definitely seen the difference globally. Um, anyway, so that, yeah, my, my uh, progression with the chamber was one of uh, being asked to be CIO and then promoted to president and then president and CEO of the chamber. And um, that's something that I, I love doing and fulfilling the social mandate of the chamber was truly my pleasure. And that, uh, that social mandate is something that I fulfill today, regardless of my not continuing involvement in a leadership role at the chamber. Mm -hmm. I still love raising awareness, 
facilitating adoption and inspiring advocacy. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, for commerce, consumers, people building careers in and around blockchain. That's, that's what I loved. That's what I do. And now I'm just doing it with DFM data core mm -hmm. in a very specific vertical with supply chain. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'm the way I'm hearing it is very encouraging journey that you have. We will definitely explore more about your career as well in the later section. But right now, moving towards our next segment, which is the questions from the audience. So I have shortlisted a couple of questions from for you, and uh, I would love to hear more from that. So one question that I have shortlisted is, how do you explain blockchain technology to someone who doesn't know it at all? Yeah, um, most people confuse blockchain with just Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. generally, the explanation has to start with, you know, blockchain is not Bitcoin, but Bitcoin was one of the first instances built on a blockchain. And the the best way that I've heard to understand blockchain is having a, a group text, right? If you if you have a group text that's sent out, everyone that gets that text knows what that message is, right? It's it's verifiable. You can't pretend that's not what was on the text. And on a blockchain, once that message is put out there, it's verifiable. And there's there's multiple points of reference that can say, you know what, this is the truth. This is what should be on the blockchain. And if you try to change something on it, there's a fun thing called a hash. And basically, it can take any data mm -hmm. and apply an algorithm that, that creates a string of letters and numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you change anything in that data if you change a period if you change a capitalization of a letter the hash changes mm -hmm. and it's no longer the same it doesn't match and so everyone's like nope that's not right that's not verifiable that's not the correct data that was originally entered on the blockchain mm -hmm. so it, it gives a layer of trust that wasn't possible prior to that technology so um, there's, there's a lot of nuances with blockchain. There are private blockchains, there's public bo blockchains. Um, there's really blockchains that aren't quite blocks in a chain. They're more of a, of a web or a mesh, but it's, it's bringing together data in such a way that it can be verified across whatever your, um, your community is, whether it's a public community or just a private group of companies that are agreeing on this way of storing data. And um, it's, it's just a different way of doing business. And cryptocurrencies are a part of that. So to, to help people understand, you know, blockchain is like this massive ecosystem mm -hmm. where Bitcoin is one cryptocurrency and cryptocurrencies are just part of the financial services vertical which there's multiple verticals that are being impacted, right? There's education, there's real estate, there's supply chain, um, so many impact zones. We have governments that are implementing blockchain and part of their business process flow. There's so much that can be done when you can guarantee that data that comes in and is agreed upon and entered into the blockchain will remain and be truly what it was when it was first entered even when it's being checked, you know, years from now, um, that's that's really the the value of blockchain. It's immutable over time. You can't have the winners changing history, and that's something that's happened over and over and over. Whoever wins decides how they want the future to see them, and they pretend things happened that didn't happen, and that things didn't happen that did. And that's not okay. And blockchain helps stop that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And I hope that helped the audience as well to simplify, uh, to get the simplified definition of the blockchain when you are dealing with the non-technical people. So thank you so much. And next question we have is, what is cryptography? What is its role in blockchain? Is it possible to name some leading open source platforms for developing blockchain applications? I'm I'm sorry I didn't quite oh, hear that clearly yes, at the beginning of the question. Of actually merged together. So first question is what is cryptography, and what its role? What is its role in the blockchain? 
is it possible to name some leading open source platforms for developing blockchain applications so is it possible yeah, um, yeah. so some okay some cryptography yeah yeah ab absolutely um cryptography was a little bit of what i was talking about with the hashing mechanism earlier uh, you you have an opportunity to take data that would be readable and convert it into something that no human being can understand, but it represents the data that it's attached to. So that that's one of the really powerful aspects and implementations that go into blockchain technology. Um, there's uh, implementations of blockchain and and platforms that allow people to interact with it um that I, i'm having come to mind pistis.io and um feng hao is a, a gentleman who leads the education vertical at the chamber and he has designed that platform to allow people to come in have a sandbox to be able to create um, certifications to um, have a immutable record of their educational experience where all of their, um, you know, whether it's a diploma or a, a class that they took that they got verification that they, you know, achieved at a certain level, all of that can go onto their record that can be checked and, and verified over time. And because of that immutability of the blockchain, people can trust that record. And so it's it's something that, you know, you have validators. So if you have the university validating that data when it was first entered, then you can trust it as you go forward that, yes, that truly was um, a, a degree or um, a, a class that, that was completed by that person at that institution. So those those types of implementations are, are really the, you know, th that's, the adoption of those is is really what's going to bring forward blockchain technology into our everyday lives. Um, I don't know how many people have been frustrated when they've been, you know, getting a new job and they have to get their their background, their education, their their you know back work history validated. It's frustrating. You know, you're sending letters. You have to get certified mail. You've got to, you know, and sometimes you're you're trying to connect with organizations that. You know, they, they may no longer be in business. Um, you know, stuff stuff happens over time. And if you don't have an immutable record, mm -hmm. there's massive pain points and kind of your your past can disappear um, at, with no fault of your own, right? So so blockchain can, can help keep that from happening and platforms like Pistis.io are ones that can help support that. Yeah, yeah. so this, uh, is this the platform which I mentioned in the introduction that the blockchain ecosystem behind? Uh, which you are mentioning here that you know it is the it is designed and it's available like kind of a sandbox. Yeah, um, Pistis.io does does have a, a sandbox and allow people to to interact with uh, blockchain technology. And that block, the blockchain ecosystem.io is a collective you know, location where people can collaborate, can meet others that are interested in the same verticals they are. Um, it's it's a social media platform where you can have groups and um, you know different uh, like one of one of the things you can do is you can pose a question and the community can respond with like 30 second video clips so it's it's just a different way of connecting and communicating and um, I think Clubhouse I don't know if you've seen that um, platform yet but they they have an interesting approach that some of the components are are also in the the blockchain ecosystem io platform yeah um, we'll definitely check that the clubhouse as well and i would encourage the audience to check the both the platforms that you mentioned uh, to interact and see more about the blockchain so moving towards our next uh, question from the audience is uh, blockchain has a reputation or image challenge as it is still heavily dependent on crypto how can we overcome it yeah, um, blockchain got a big black eye, I would say. Um, back in 2017, mostly, that's that's when there was the, the hype cycle where there, there were a lot of scam projects. There were a lot of companies that were opportunistic and they saw this emerging technology. They thought of all the use cases that it could possibly be applied against. And then they said, 
okay, I'm going to tell people that I can solve for this big problem using blockchain and I'm going to have a token, I'm going to issue it and people raise tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, some even billions and some have produced and a lot haven't. So yes, definite pain point. And, you know, it's kind of like a, a research and development fund that uh-huh. most people didn't realize that they were paying into R&D rather than like owning equity in a company, okay. right? So it, it was um, a lot was done not under the SEC rules, which we're starting to see uh, some legislation against the companies that didn't do the the appropriate things. And I'm not going to name any. Everybody can see them in the news. Mm-hmm. But what can we do differently as an industry, right? That, that's really the, the crux of the question. And we've had some really strong projects that have actually worked to deliver on their promises and have done so. And we have companies that are working to use blockchain technology in their infrastructure mm-hmm. and are just working at creating efficiencies and building business process flow that is, cost saving. Um, banks are doing that. We're, we're starting to see just very, very solid implementation of blockchain technology across multiple verticals. And, you know, financial services is definitely one of the main ones. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see governments. Um, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many calls I've been on um, with people that are, are working with different state governments in India that are working with different states in the United States, that are working with countries in Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, Europe has a, a big, I mean, a, a consortia that is focused on blockchain implementation. Australia has been doing some great work lately. So it's, there's a lot going on that is just fundamentally, solidly implementing the technology in ways that it makes sense. And it doesn't have to be connected to cryptocurrency, right? That's, that's one of the things most people don't grasp is that they can invest in blockchain technology that isn't necessarily crypto related. And that, that's, hard to, that's hard to talk about when what's happening right now is we're having this massive bull run in cryptocurrencies. I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen the, you know, the price of Bitcoin go over $40,000. Um, I think that's just the beginning. I mean, it's, it's doubled in 21 days, but the, the odds are, if you look at history, that it will at least 10x in the coming year. So it, it, it is exciting, and I think people need to decide if it's an appropriate diversification for their portfolio and then act, right? That's the important thing. You can, you can give mental assent, but if you don't act... Uh-huh. Nothing changes in your life. But uh, all that said, um, the, the real value of blockchain going forward is going to be in business implementation, not just the cryptocurrency side of things. So we have to stay level headed on that and understand where the real value is. But um, taking, taking value out of this transition from um, fiat currency to cryptocurrency uh, is, is something that is something that everyone should look into for themselves and do their own research. Mm-hmm. And if it makes sense to invest part of your assets into the fifth largest currency in the world now, mm-hmm. Bitcoin might be um, it might be a good choice for you. Yes. So I'm I'm not doing financial advice or anything like that, but I can I can honestly say it has been the best absolutely hands down functioning investment in our portfolio. Mm-hmm. And I, I haven't seen anything to match it uh, in history. Yep, yep, for sure actually. AI and blockchain are the kind of a leading technology trends that as well as I can see as a future as well. So this is very insightful and thank you so much for sharing uh, and answering the audience questions. Moving towards our next segment is the fun segment where I'm going to give you three keywords like the words associated with your profile and you have to tell me what comes to your mind. So it is just kind of a, any, you can just give abstract like a keyword for that particular keyword or you can just tell like a short definition or whatever comes to your mind. So are you ready? 
Okay. I've, I'm hoping that I hear the words clearly. So if I say something that sounds really off base, it's because I might have misheard. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, don't take, like, you know, it is just a fun segment. So it's completely fine. Uh, whatever comes to your mind, you have to just carry it. The first word is investor. Is what? Investor. Investor. I blank. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. Uh, you can tell anything like, you know, when you come to an investor, like, you know, it is associated with your profile. So what do you think about when it comes to investment? investment? Maybe you can just say that future is the blockchain. So it's better to invest in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, when, when I think of investor, I think of, of risk and yeah. being willing to step into it. So that that's just a big concept and it was it's hard to put a name you know just one yeah. word onto it i think yeah uh, you're willing to take risk yes yeah so that is something like you know that is completely like abstract content like you know that and i feel like it is you came up with the good one actually that willing to uh so that's that's definitely a good one um moving towards the next word is blockchain freedom of speech wow and then uh, the third keyword is education. Joy. Wow, I love the both. No, I I love I I love yeah. teaching. Yeah. And one of the things that um, I had a rule for my kids, and yeah. they had to make good choices. And my rule, my job, was to inspire desire. Mm -hmm. And if you can inspire desire, it is such a joy. And I think education should be that. It, it should be that joy of making good choices when you are inspired to, to learn and grow. So yeah, yeah. Education is a kind of a thing that, you know, creates a huge impact. Because if I see my career journey or anybody, like if you see your career journey as well, some of the teachers brings an impact on you. And uh, liking and disliking of the subject or the area of expertise also depends mm -hmm. on the teachers that you interact with. So it's purely important that, you know, kind of an education system you are in, the teachers that you are interacting, they enjoy it actually teaching and, you know, giving it to the students. So yeah. this is a really very important thing. And uh, I think you did really very great actually because you came up with only one word. So thank you so much. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, moving towards the next section is about exploring your career work and volunteering. The first question that I do have under that section is, you are a co-founder of DataDFMCorp.incorporation. Would you like to share more insights about it so that audience can get more awareness and what it does kind of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the CEO of DFM Data Corp is Michael Darden. And he actually came to the chamber while I was serving as president and CEO. And he shared about a patent that he had written back in 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't own this patent, but I think I might be able to get it. And it defines digital freight matching. Dynamic freight matching is, is at the core of this. This is about matching driver, tractor, trailer load in a digital way, whether it's on an app or via email, you know, any kind of driver rating or you know, all of those details. He actually, back in 2004, had 37 claims that were accepted by the, the United States Patent Office as being unique. And he has the right through 2025 now to be able to manage the dynamic freight matching industry. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me about this and I'm going, wow, that's a big footprint. You know, how do you do that? Because the thing with patents is what they do is they give you the right to tell everyone else who's doing what your patent allows for to stop doing it. You mm -hmm. can send out cease and desist letters where they no longer have the right to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you're the only one that has the right to do that or the only one to license others to do it. So I'm like, what are you going to do with this? How are you going to manage this? And he said, well, the reason I wrote it in the first place was to help the industry become what I thought it could be. Uh -huh. And he's like, that's what I want to do. I want to help it grow. And one of the things that I, I recognized when I was writing this patent 
is mm-hmm. when there were multiple companies doing the same thing, they would have what's called phantom data or duplicated data mm-hmm. where drivers would post themselves on multiple boards. Mm-hmm. Um, people that had loads would put them on multiple boards. And then when they actually got picked off of one, they would no longer be really available, but they would still be seen on the other boards. Uh-huh. Right. And so people are thinking they're getting a load and they call and call and the load doesn't exist anymore. Or they think they're getting a driver and they wait for the driver to show up. And that driver was never really available because they got picked up two hours ago. You know, so Michael saw this and said, I want to build a utility that helps solve for this problem. And none of the companies that are currently, and there's over 200 companies currently engaging in digital dynamic freight matching in the United States. I mean, we're talking about, you know, Uber Freight, um, you know, Walmart, UPS, FedEx, um, you know, Convoy. I mean, it's just the massive companies. They're all doing dynamic freight matching. And no one of them can say to the industry, hey, let's get together and, you know, anonymize our data and, and use it in such a way that we can cleanse each other's boards, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's not going to be enough trust. And so what Michael was saying is we need to build a thread of trust. And I think blockchain can be part of that solution. This mm-hmm. cryptography thing, this hashing, I think that can be part of the solution. And so it was from that conversation. And, you know, Michael became a member of the chamber. DFM Data is a member of the chamber. And I became its first investor. Mm-hmm. So I, I invested in the idea, in the concept of helping the industry solve for a really big problem that they can't solve for on their own. Mm-hmm. And so when I transitioned from leaving the chamber, um, that was kind of a, a fun story where I had uh, I had a moment of clarity when I recognized that I could choose what brought me joy. And I, I, love, I love fulfilling the social mandate of the chamber, but when I recognized that my job as president and CEO was to go get money, I realized that that's not what brings me joy. And there's, there's people that are really, like, they're motivated by that. Mm-hmm. That, that in, incentivizes them to action. And what incentivized me to action was helping support the efforts of the members of the chamber and actually facilitating adoption and working collaboratively and whether or not that brought immediate funds to the chamber, I I really didn't care. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, for that role, there needed to be somebody who really cared about that aspect. And so when I, when I realized that I, I had a a meeting with the the core team and board members and um, I said, I, I need to resign. And, uh, I, I brought together uh, two people that are now the co-CEOs of the chamber that are, are wonderfully designed to, to meet that role. And I get to do what I love. And after I resigned, I had four job offers. And one of them was to be the executive vice president of DFM Data. Mm-hmm. And so I, I took that with joy because it was part of fulfilling what I felt was my purpose that was facilitating adoption of blockchain technology. And so I get to be part of the steering committee that helps bring to the industry a solution that they couldn't create on their own without a platform like the, the DFM data utility. So yeah, that's, that's where, where I am now and uh, what, what brings me joy. Yeah, thank you so much. And it was wonderful actually to hear more about the DFM Corp and how it stands for the purpose as well. So thank you so much. And moving towards our next question is, what does blockchain chamber of commerce, what services and offerings they provide? Already you mentioned a couple of things actually in earlier section, but I would like to hear more about it and what does it stand for and what does it does actually. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was It was something that I truly enjoyed being a part of. Uh-huh. And one of the one of the ways that the chamber serves the community is by bringing together not just, you know, company to company collaboration, because we have examples of that, you know, say with DSM Data Corp, um, you know, all of their their technology implementation has been through Kilroy blockchain, which is another member of the chamber. Uh-huh. And we facilitated that connection so that they could work together better. And so, you know, there's, there's that aspect of what the chamber does, you know, bringing together two members or a member connecting them to somebody else who, who has 
what they need, um, but also bringing together the conversation globally. And probably one of the, the things that happened that, you know, was, was one of the big like, okay, this is why we exist. Mm-hmm. Um, we, were, we were able to bring together um, players from the supply chain industry mm-hmm. that ended up in a collaboration between GS1, mm-hmm. uh, IEEE, and BETA, which is the Blockchain and Transportation Alliance. Um, and that, that was made possible in the standards that are going to be aligned because of it globally, not just for the U.S., but globally, were initiated through a chamber event that was focused on supply chain. So, you know, that, that kind of activity is, is what the chamber does. It's, it's, a, it's a party that doesn't have a dog in the fight, uh-huh. but can see the dots around the world and say, how can these work better together? How can we support the adoption of blockchain technology, of emerging technologies globally? It's not about any specific, you know, individual or group or company or country even. Uh, it's, it's about helping people have better outcomes in their lives and businesses because of emerging technologies like blockchain. So that, that's, that's what I love um, about working at the chamber, the, the value add that's there. Um, comes in part in, in what you're wanting to engage with, right? So you can, you can do your membership and, you know, pay online and, you know, okay, I'm a member, but if you don't attend the, the events, if you, if you don't seek to collaborate with other members, uh-huh. if you don't share, you know, this is, this is what I need, uh-huh. you're not going to get the same positive outcomes as somebody who engages and participates and, you know, follows up with connections that are chamber members. And, you know, it's, it's, the, it's like any other organization uh-huh. in, in that you get out what you put in to a certain extent. But um, I had somebody say that it was, it was good people coming together for the right reason uh-huh. that made them so happy to be a member of the chamber. And, uh, you know, being, being called the voice of reason in the blockchain swamp was probably one of the biggest compliments I got on LinkedIn, um, you know, when I was participating in, in events and, and speaking into the community. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of garbage out there and being able to connect with people that truly have your best interests at heart uh-huh. and aren't running their own agenda, you know, to, to take advantage. Um, that's really the value of the chamber. Yep, yep. And that's really very valuable, actually, because I feel... Uh, when we think about this blockchain, like the latest technologies and trends, emerging technologies, there's a lot of things available open source, but it is very hard when it comes to, you know, when people want to, want to see something like very specific about that trend. And I think uh, definitely this blockchain commerce is doing a great job, blockchain chamber commerce. So thank you so much for sharing that and hope that is helpful to the audience as well. Moving towards one more question under this section is about your volunteering work. So you do volunteering at Blooming Dark Incorporation, Pfizer One Sixty. Would you like to share more about it so the audience can understand and be more aware, and you know maybe they can join this uh, initiative as well if they can participate. Absolutely. No, and, and thank you for the opportunity because it's it's something that for years, uh, ever since my sister wrote the book Bloom in the Dark. Wow. And I, I helped edit it. Um, I actually participated in, in doing a, um, a, a verbal rendition of it as well. And I mean, I was, I was in tears. Um, I, the, the description in the book, um, you know, it says that you should, you should read it with a box of tissues and a box of chocolate mm-hmm. um, because it's, it's impactful. It's, it's stories of real women that have been victims and it shares their journey to healing, and it, it gives hope. So the, the the book was the genesis of the the organization of the nonprofit that currently exists, and it was the beginning of the TV show that's called Bloom Today, and that's in over 200 countries now. It's mul- it's in multiple um, languages. It is seeking to get out the message that you don't have to stay a victim. And, you know, women aren't the only ones victimized, but obviously my, my sister as a woman um, was speaking from her personal experience in some of those stories. And that's why it's, it's very near and dear to my heart, because I, I get the journey 
of healing. And I understand that it's not an easy one. It's not an easy one to, to be on, on your own and to know that you're not alone and to be able to read the stories and see the stories of other people who have had, in some cases, easier experiences, but in many cases, much, much worse experiences than you might have had. Um, it's empowering. It, it's, you know, if, if they could go past and, and grow out of that pain, so can I. Right. So that's that's the beauty of, of what Bloom in the Dark brings and, you know, creating beauty from a, a pie. It's, it's the fertilizer of your past uh-huh. that can can truly help you grow today. And that's that's what Bloom in the Dark brings um, as a message. And uh, it is one of hope and healing and something that I am very happy to continue to engage with and support and educate around and point people to because it's it's a powerful message and it's life changing and there's a lot of lives out there around the world that still need to be changed for the better. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing and definitely you know before this episode comes out I'll uh, publish some of the highlights as well as you mentioned about something about the uh, blockchain commerce system ecosystem as well as this book actually uh, I wasn't aware that it is uh, written by your sister so I would definitely encourage audience to check this out. Moving towards our next section is about tips and advice, and you can support your uh, answer with the books and courses as well. So any tips or advice would you like to give to the students or the professionals who wants to pursue their passion in this specific field or looking this as their long-term career option? Have patience, <laughs> yeah. have, have purpose, mm-hmm. and follow your passion even past the pain. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's, there's a lot of bumps that come along the way. Uh-huh. And if, if you're not willing to work past and through them, you'll, you'll become frustrated and, and feel like you can't fulfill your dreams. Uh-huh. And my, my biggest advice is, is just do the next thing first. Uh-huh. Don't be stuck where you are thinking, oh, there's nothing. No, what is the next thing that will take me towards my goal? And do it. Do it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, oh, if only I had bought Bitcoin. And blah, and I'm like, okay, so what's stopping you today? Uh-huh. Right? What's stopping you now? Yes. And if you ask yourself that question and you either solve for what's stopping you or you just act anyway, uh-huh. you're going to have a much better outcome. You're going to have much better success regardless of what your passion and purpose and path in life is. Wow. So do it. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's, I think, best advice to have, thing to have, to any, irrespective of any field they want to get into. And uh, uh, talking more specific about the blockchain, do you like to share a kind of a specific books or the courses uh, to the audience? Yeah, there's there's a great book that I just wrote the forward to, so I'm just going to shamelessly pitch it. Um, <laughs> it's called What's Hot in Crypto and Blockchain. Mm-hmm. So, or blockchain and crypto. I'm dyslexic, so I reverse things sometimes. Um, but it's it's a book that was written by uh, Ash Costello. She was the the main lead that I connected with. Um, and it's just stories of people that have done really interestingly. And in, I mean, that there, it's, it is, I, I said this in the forward, it's truly idea sex. When, when you read the book, the different chapters, you're, you're able to combine things that are part of your past experience. And you're, you're hearing these new ideas and these thoughts that when you bring them together, can help create something brand new. It can create a, a, a possibility for you to have new IP. It can give you an idea about how you can apply this emerging technology into your own business. Um, you know, just create something. And that's, that's why I call it idea sex. You bring together, you know, two ideas and you come out with something uniquely different and new and something that you now own and are able to, to act on. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's a, it's an absolutely must read because the people that you'll be introduced to in that book mm-hmm. are the thought leaders of today. They, they are the people whose technology is going to change the way the world works. Mm-hmm. And if you kind of see it on the front end, then you have a chance to be part of that transformation. 
and what you choose to do with that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that could truly be the biggest game changer. People might know your name and not theirs because of what you did with their content and how you made it your own and acted on it. So it's, it's a great read, absolutely would recommend it. And 101 Blockchains is another great resource um, if you're looking for you know, trainings and different things in blockchain. There's, there's a whole lot of opportunities out there to learn. Mm -hmm. You just have to decide that you're going to take the steps mm -hmm. to learn and then to, to engage. So yeah, opportunities out there. Yeah, thank you so much. And definitely I'm going to check out the books as well. As well as I'm going to post this to the audience as well so that they can check it out whoever wants to explore more about the blockchain area. So thank you so much. And we are moving towards the end of the show, which is like a leadership. So you are truly, it's, 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 it is no doubt actually that you are leading your area of interest. So what is your leadership style and any specific leader that you always follow or admire and why? <sighs> I <laughs> your tagline says that actually because leading to serve uh, that I can see that it is kind of a servant leadership but definitely I would like to hear more from you over that yeah no no thank you and and it is that that focus on servant leadership that I I got from watching my father and um you know I was I was trying to think of you know what big name you know do I do I know um, that I would say that's that's who I would go to um, as as a reference point as to you know why I do what I do and and why I have been able to step into the opportunities that have been put in front of me and um, I have to point to my dad um, he's a he's a pioneer uh, he was someone who was willing to step into his passion even into the unknown and the fear of the unknown is in my opinion the biggest fear. Um, my my father went um, with a, a young wife to uh -huh. Ghana, Africa, um, and was there when, in in that time frame, when people packed to go to Ghana, they they packed in coffins, uh -huh. because that's how they would come back. And um, you know, he had his first child. I, I tell people, you know, yeah, my oldest sister is is an African American. She was African before she was American. Uh -huh. um, but then he spent eight years in the jungles of Peru, and uh, once again, so many unknowns. Um, so many people would not have been willing to step into the opportunity to serve others at their own peril. And um, yeah, it's it's just that that leading by example, right? Yes. Um, I just, I didn't realize it, it um, made me emotional. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, uh, you, you can't, you can't read it from a book. Uh -huh. um, you, you can't uh, absorb from, you know, just somebody telling you. Mm -hmm. But when, when you watch servant leadership in action, um, it, it gives you something to, to build your own base of action from and so yeah that's uh that's that's where i guess my leadership style comes from why i am a servant leader is because i i saw servant leadership in action from my dad thank you so much and it was really wonderful talking to you and for me this was like the best episode and hope audience can relate to it as well and before we going to end this i'm going to end it with your leadership style so i'm going to end it with uh, the quote that is from Robert Greenleaf, which says, the servant leader is the servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. And on that quote, we are going to end this episode. See you in the next episode. And as I always say, until we meet happy leading, let's lead together. Stay safe. Bye for now. <laughs>